Okay. All right. I hope you're all there. I think you're all there. Here we are. We're going to start our meeting. Um, now that I've finished wrestling with technology, why don't we begin with prayer? I should have done that to begin with. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, O comforter of the spirit of truth, who art everywhere present, filling all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come abide in us, cleanse us of every stain, and save, O good one, our souls. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Welcome. Um, I'll begin our time together before we jump into our subject just by throwing out a, a loaded question. So how did the fast go for you? Dun, 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 he asked a question. Um, how did the fast go? You know, one of the things we do as Orthodox Christians, we fast. And as people who are new to the faith or our catechumens or are approaching the faith uh, with the intent of conversion, we, we learn about fasting. We learn about the idea of fasting and we learn about doing it. Um, that you'll notice pretty quickly in the church, there's a cycle that we go through, a cycle over and over again of fasting and feasting and fasting and feasting and fasting and feasting. So we, in a short amount of time in the near future, we will talk about what is the fasting part, why do you do it and how do you do it? But I'll ask you real quickly, just in passing today, what's the feasting part? Bringing out the fancy bread in church. Uh, related to it, but that's not it. Is it when you get to throw off the shackles of the fast and once again eat pizza? No. 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 Not officially. What is the feast? Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is the feast. The Eucharist is the feast. It begins at the holy altar. And when we come up before the altar of Christ, as we do every Sunday, and receive his body and blood. That's the feast. What flows out from that is the celebration. Uh, things like the Articlasia, with the blessed, those five loaves of sweet bread that are often served in some churches with powdered sugar all over them, which the clergy despise because it gets all over us. And so I always tell the people, leave the sugar off. But the beautiful loaves that we kiss and that we partake of to commemorate Christ's feeding of the 5,000 in the wilderness, which was itself an image of the Eucharist. The feast is the Eucharist. And when we enjoy the blessings at our own tables in our own homes uh, of barbecued wings or a pizza or a nice steak or a piece of chicken or whatever it might be, we enjoy that blessing there by first asking the Lord to be present and to bless this food because of all that has happened in his house at his table. So it all begins there, the Eucharist. That's the feast. Um, it's important that we fast, and we'll talk about that later. As I said, uh, Christ didn't say, if you feel like fasting. He said, when you fast, expecting that we would. Um, we don't make it up on our own. You know, we don't make it up. Some of us come from traditions where the question was asked, um, what are you going to give up for Lent? Something like that. Uh, that is not at all an orthodox question uh, because it is prescribed for us by the church what you are intended to give up. Uh, how you do that. How you apply that standard of the fast, which never changes, ever. The standard of the fast, how you apply that to your lives is something you work out between you and your spiritual father in the sacrament of confession or in counseling where you sit and talk and say, here are my limitations. You know, 
and he'll give you guidance. And then some people will come along and say, mm -mm 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 -mm, because Yaya said, Yaya taught us, this is how you fast. You know, where did that come from? Yaya didn't cook it, you know, grandma didn't cook it up in her brain. It came from her experience in her family or in her village with their spiritual father back at that time. So somewhere in there, was a history of the family interacting with a spiritual father and him saying, for you at this time, this is how you're supposed to do it. And it became institutionalized. This is how everybody should do it. No, not necessarily. The fast never changes, but how we apply it in our own homes with our limitations and our crosses that we carry, that changes. So we will talk about that anyway. I hope you had a good fast, uh, whatever form it took. I hope it was a blessing. It's given to us as a blessing by the Lord. And uh, I also hope that tomorrow you have a good feast. If you're not in a position to receive the Eucharist for whatever reason, nevertheless, we come and we offer to the Lord everything, right? Everything that we are. So God willing, that will come soon. Before we dive in, do you have any questions or things you wanted to bring up or things you wanted to talk about, things you've seen or you've heard? Uh, this is your chance to get out the little notebook and say, you know, I've been meaning to ask, what is that thing you do? Not today? Okay, that's fine. Go ahead and uh, do that if you'd like in the future. There's always time for questions. Okay, so today let's talk about something that is central to our experience as Orthodox Christians, the teachings of Christ. Teachings of Christ. People love to say, you know, Reader's Digest, Life Magazine. Is Life Magazine still there? I don't know. Reader's Digest is. But everybody like to say, you know, Jesus was a great teacher, a great teacher, but few have actually followed up with a study of his teachings, uh, settling instead for the identification of his teachings with the golden rule, sort of a hallmark version of Jesus. Um, but, you know, in his own day, in his own day, the Lord's teachings were often very unpopular, very unpopular. And we'll talk about why. First, they were controversial. If you read through the Sermon on the Mount, and in a little while we will, if we have time, read through some of the Sermon on the Mount together. Uh, the Lord asked uh, controversial things of his followers controversial things, difficult things. Secondly, the Lord claimed, uh, well, before we even do that, I'm changing my mind. Before we do that, let's look at one of the difficult things that he asked. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 6, we read, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, there's something controversial. And I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And Jesus goes on to explain it. And even then, 
it wasn't sufficient because the scripture says from that time on, his disciples went back and walked. Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So many of them at that point bugged out and said, too much for me. Too much for me. This talk about his flesh and his blood. He also claimed to be God. Some people don't agree with that. Some people think that Jesus really didn't claim to be God. You know, a simple examination of a few verses ought to do it. Don't you think? We don't have to read everything, but let's look at Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 62, where Jesus says, or the scripture says, And the high priest arose and said to him, him being Jesus, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. What was he saying there? Yeah, that's me. Yes, I am the Son of the living God. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. We don't need any more witnesses. It was clear what our Lord was saying. And the other gospel writers make similar reports that our Lord claimed very clearly to be the Son of God and equal to the Father. Look at an interesting passage, though, with me in John chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10, we read a very familiar chapter. Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things that he spoke. Then he said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. And skipping down to verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Where did he get this imagery, this idea of a shepherd? If you look in the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 35, excuse me, 34, Beginning at verse 11, listen to what the prophet Ezekiel wrote. For thus says the Lord, the Lord, Behold, I shall search for my sheep and care for them as a shepherd seeks his flock. On a day when there is darkness and when a cloud separates the sheep, thus will I drive them from every place where they were scattered in the day of cloud and darkness, and I shall bring them out from the Gentiles and gather them from the countries and bring them into their land. I shall feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, in all the inhabited places of the land. I shall feed them in good pasture on the high mountains of Israel, and their folds will be there. They will lie down, and there they shall rest in good luxury and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I shall feed my sheep and refresh them, and they will know that I am the Lord. The Lord knew the scriptures. And when he used images like that of the shepherd, he expected his hearers to get it, to know the scriptures. And in fact, one of the things he told 
the uh, leaders of the Jews so often, the Pharisees, was that you don't know me because you don't know the scriptures. So you don't know me. So Jesus claimed controversial things. He claimed to be the son of the living God. He also claimed that the only thing in life worth having was the kingdom of God. And he went on to say, not only is it the only thing worth having, but it's going to cost you everything to get it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, Jesus said, seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. A pearl of great price. Because of this, the ethical teaching of the church is concerned with only one thing, only one thing, and that is obtaining the kingdom of God. That's all. That's all. So politics, wealth, friendships, popularity, physical health, family ties, power, and influence, none of these things will help you obtain the kingdom of God. All of them, or any of them individually, may very well get in the way. And so the church asks of us to lay all of them on the altar and be willing to give them up for the kingdom of God. That's a shocking thing. How can we do that? How can we choose the kingdom of God over being politically correct? Whatever that means to you. How can we choose it over wealth and all the security and the opportunities that wealth brings? How can we choose it perhaps over the benefits of education? How can we choose it over physical health? How can we choose it over all these things? And yet in the lives of the saints, God bless you. In the lives of the saints, both those record, recorded in scripture and those recorded after, we see them consistently choosing Christ over all these other things. What does Christ say? Seek first the kingdom of God. Then all these other things will fall into place, right? But seek first the kingdom of God. Remember when Christ talked about the, uh, the rich landowner, the rich farmer who had much, and he said to himself, what in the world am I going to do with all my grain? I know. I'll tear down the old barns and build new ones, and I will store up my grain, and I will say to my soul, relax, you got it made, right? We might say that and might shake our heads and say, what a fool, but we might say that about any of the things I just listed. Not grain in barns, but I have education or I have money, or at least I have the right political ideas and I see things as they are. If only people would listen to me. Like my brother used to say, my older brother, I hope you're listening, Gary. If only they would make me king. <laughs> but if we are honest, we're just like that, just like that man who says, take it easy, you got it made, only to remember we are fools. Soon our souls will be required of us. So the goal of the Orthodox Christian life is one thing and one thing only. And that is the transfiguration, which we just celebrated, right? the transfiguration of our lives into the likeness of God. That's our goal. That's our goal. So if we want to be transfigured, and I hope we do, raises the question, how do you do it? How do you do it? How should we live if we want to be like God? And the answer is to live like he lived when he became flesh and walked with us. And as he taught us to live in the words, the actions of the gospel. Okay, We see it in the gospels if we read them, how he lived. I remember as a young man struggling with the Christian faith and a priest saying to me, read the gospel 
and don't try and interpret it. Just ask yourself one question. Did anybody ever live like he lived before? And the answer was no. And then he said, now ask yourself, what does that require of you? And what it requires of me and of all of us is to follow him, to live as he lived. You see it in the pages of the gospel and in the book of the Acts of the apostles as they began to live as their Lord lived. After the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were given power, they were given courage, they were given authority and the various gifts that the Spirit gave, and they lived as the Lord lived. And you and I have been given the same gift. The gift of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are called to live as he lived. And you will say, nobody can do that. But the saints are evidence to us that ordinary people like you and me, and there are all sorts of different saints, married saints, single saints, monastic saints, non-monastic saints, martyrs, people who are never martyred, but just lived and sweated it out to the end of their days. Female saints, male saints, children saints, old saints, all sorts of saints. Prove to us this can be done. This is what we're called to do. Which is why so many spiritual fathers will tell their spiritual children as part of their daily discipline, read the Gospels. Read the Gospels. Look how Jesus lived. Listen to what he said carefully. Listen carefully. Apply this in your life over and over. You know, I have to read it multiple and multiple times. Yes, you do. Sometimes it's like, what? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Right. This, you know. So sometimes spiritual fathers will say, read as much as you can. Maybe that's five verses. Maybe that's five chapters. You know, my, spirit, my son's spiritual father told him, read three chapters a day. And if you don't understand it, talk about it with your dad. Talk about it with Father Sava. Talk about it with me. But read every day. Because it's a washing. And over time, as we hear, and as we hear, and as we hear, we begin slowly to get it. Yeah, there's certain things, yes, and then it, it's interesting of things that we've been talking about, and then I'm reading, and it's going, oh, Father just said that. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I, I get that, but. Um, yeah. But this is our calling. Yeah. We have to learn how to do it. How do we learn if we don't read, if we don't see? You know, Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, Keep the commandments. How do you do it? Well, read the gospel. You'll see. You'll see how he did it. He said, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. You got to do a lot better than them. How do you do that? Look at the gospel. Read it. I would add to that, look at the lives of the saints the lives of the saints. They flesh it out for us. They show us these things. You know? So we have to learn to be righteous. St. James said in his epistle that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So the first thing we have to understand is that when he wrote that, he was not talking about me and probably not about you. That doesn't mean we can't be righteous. It just means right now, we aren't yet. We're called to be. So what is the standard? What's the blueprint? Again, the Gospels. We look at the pages of the Gospels. Specifically, where do we look? Well, we can begin by looking at the Sermon on the Mount. If we look in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, seven and eight, we see the Lord teaching very clearly how we ought to live. And it can be summed up 
I mean, we'll look at it, but it can be summed up very simply. It can be summed up in the words of the Shema Yisrael, which was sort of the creed of ancient Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the summary of the law. It's the summary of the Ten Commandments, which was themselves, which was itself a summary of the whole body of the law, which would take a while to read through. So summaries are important. They help us know how to live. I remember again, at a time when I was facing enormous temptation, I went to a priest and was talking to him. And we talked and we talked and we talked. And I think, God forgive me, I think he was growing frustrated. So finally he said to me, listen, listen, okay? Love and do what you want. Love and do what you want. And then he said, think about it. And he walked away. And I thought, fine. I get to love and do what I want. And at first I said, woohoo. And as I was walking away, I thought, oh no. <laughs> if I love, who do I have to love? Love of self isn't love. You have to love another. If I, who do I have to love? I guess I have to love God. Okay, I love God. But if I love God, then does that mean I have to obey him? And if I love God, God expects me to love other people. So I have to love them. Where do I fit into all this? And I began to realize I didn't fit into all this. My job was to love God and to obey him. Because what did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. And then after him, my job was to love others and to seek their good and their welfare. And that I came in a far distant last, and if, if at all. My focus was to be on the first two. And I realized in telling me that, the priest was telling me, get your priorities straight. You know, if you want to live as a Christian, you live as Christ did. You love God and then others. And you put yourself out of the picture. That ruined my day. But he gave me in that sentence, he gave me the gospel. So I'm always grateful. I'm always grateful. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another uh, as I've loved you. That's the standard. So where do we see how he loved us? In the Gospel. We have to read it. We have to listen to it. Uh, we have ample opportunities in our culture to do that. Uh, you can't swing a dead cat in this country and not find a Bible. It might not be the greatest translation, but you'll find one. Uh, if all else fails, check into a cheap motel and you'll find one in the side table. They're everywhere. Thank God. If you have access to the internet, which it seems almost everyone does, you can read it. You can hear it read to you in any different form that you want, and in several different languages. Uh, so we have opportunity. We just need to take advantage of it. We see the gospel, again, preached to us in Ephesians chapter 5, when St. Paul is giving instructions to married people, husbands and wives. This is always unpopular at weddings, and it's always prescribed to be read in a wedding always, without fail. And I always tell the wives, don't listen to the instructions given to the husbands. Listen to the instructions given to the wives. And I tell the husbands, don't listen to what the wives are told. Listen to what St. Paul says to you as husbands. 
And then I read it to them, usually in my office before the wedding. I read it to them and I say, now what, what is he asking of you? And the answer is usually from both of them to not live for myself, but to prefer my wife slash my husband ahead of me. Wives are called to submit themselves to their husbands and obey them. Harsh words in a modern culture. But that's what St. Paul said. And it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we're called to follow that today. We are called to live not for ourselves as wives, but for our husbands. And husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church, which is self sacrifice for the good of others. That means before husbands spend a dime on themselves, they make sure everyone in the family's needs are met, including their wives. Before they spend a dime on their own desires, they make sure, first of all, that their wives' desires are met and cared for. They put others before themselves. This is how husbands are called to be submissive. To put others first. They're both taking on the yoke of Christ, living for Christ through their spouse. This is Christian love. This is what it's all about. You want to be a Christian husband? Bleed like Christ. Give everything to your wife. Leave it all on the table. Leave it all on the court, as they like to say. Leave it all there for her. And wives, same thing for your husbands. This is our calling. Sacrificial love. Because when God wanted to show us the ultimate expression of love, how did he do it? He didn't send a message. He came. He took our flesh. He walked among us. He smelled like us. He ate like us. He dressed like us. He healed us. He forgave us. He stood on the cross and said, this is how much. And then he died. That's our calling sacrificial love every day every day okay there's a selfish kind of love that the world likes to embrace which is i love myself and i want you i love myself and myself requires many things to be happy including you so you must be a part of my life but that is not Christian love. And that's one of the first things when I meet with young couples that are coming to be married that I try and uproot is to teach them that's not love from a Christian point of view. Love means sacrifice, giving, preferring others first. That's love because that's what God did for us. And we see it nowhere better than in the Gospels, right? So let's take a few minutes and let's do something controversial, like actually open the pages of the Bible and read a little bit and see what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Lots of good stuff there, but I guarantee you will be challenged. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You ever seen anybody do this? We do in the pages of Acts. 
Peter and John, grabbed, arrested, first lectured, uh, and threatened by the leaders of the Jews, and then the second time, beaten and thrown into jail. And when they finally walked out, they rejoiced that they were accounted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. See, they are living it. You can do it. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it season? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So you're supposed to have good works. And others are supposed to see them because by doing that, they will glorify God. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks the one, of the one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For so I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There it is. You have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of judgment. Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause. This is why in confession, the Holy Fathers teach us when we're dealing with anger to remind people anger is the root of murder. And so we have to root out anger. So Christ takes the law, thou shalt do no murder, and he gets to the root of it and explains to live a righteous life. Not only must you not murder, you must root out anger from your life, right? Okay. Let's go further. Where am I? Um, he talks about how to pray teaching us the Our Father, and goes on to say, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you your trespasses. But if you don't forgive them their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. That's one of the teachings you don't often see quoted in the front of Reader's Digest. Jesus said, but isn't it remarkable? We must learn if we are to live the Christian life to be forgiving even when it hurts, because otherwise we will not find forgiveness. No matter how many times we go to confession, we will not find it. How to fast. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to be fasting. But your Father, who is in the secret place, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. Ouch. Where moth and rust destroys and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp is the, the lamp of the body is the eye. If there are your, for your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. What determines if your eye is good or bad? What draws it? what you're allowing to go into it, what you're looking at. There's something to paste on every computer, right? 
If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either you hate the one and love the other, or be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Okay? You have to choose who you're going to serve. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or about your body, what you will put on. He doesn't say not to put on. He says, don't worry about it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Your worry is worthless. So why do you worry about clothing? Well, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Who are Gentiles? Non-Jews? Kind of. Why are Gentiles not to be trusted? Because to Israel, God had revealed himself and not to the Gentiles. Gentiles were those who did not know God. The Jews that didn't know God were acting like Gentiles. And this is what Christ was accusing them of. You have all the revelations of God and the priesthood and the temple and the law and everything. And yet you're living like a Gentile. Because you don't know your God. Because, hello, here I am in front of you, and you don't get it. Right? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck in your eye? And look, the plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brothers. He doesn't say that we shouldn't be concerned about the speck. He just wants us to get the plank out first. Right? This is the equivalent of when the airlines say, put your mask on first and then assist your neighbor. Right? Do not give what is holy to dogs. Wow nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. That's loaded, isn't it? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? who if he has a son who asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask of him so what happens when we pray for things and we don't get it does that mean we can sit down and pray and say i want to win the lottery and then when we don't win the lottery, can accuse God of being a liar, right? No, it means that God, being a good father, looks at us and says, you don't want the lottery. You don't need the lottery. 
and to give it to you would hurt you. It's like a child saying, let me drive. Okay, well, that'll work out well, won't it? A good father will say, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I want Snickers for dinner. No, I don't think so. But yet sometimes God gives us things to teach us to want better things, right? He lets us have what we ask for sometimes so that we learn, ugh, that wasn't so good. The goal, the point of all this is that he's a good father. Sorry? Be careful what you wish for and what you ask for. You might just get it. You might get it, yeah. It's like my friend who was caught smoking by his dad and his dad did the old fashioned thing where he got a carton of cigarettes and took his son out and said, you're going to smoke every one of them before we leave this table and made his son do it. And he never wanted another cigarette <laughs> after that. He just was sick as a dog. You know, he didn't want to touch them. Sometimes our father uses different things to teach us, but this does teach us to look at God as what? Our father, not a cosmic Coke machine as Oral Roberts sometimes fashioned him, you know. You don't, don't remember who he was. That's okay. Uh, not as a slave driver. Not as the God of Islam, whose only message to us is submit. But the God who is father. He's a father. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So the Lord is teaching us, it will require effort. It will be hard sometimes. You will have to work at this. Okay, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Okay. So we are not to judge, but we are to evaluate the fruit of those who come to us and claim to be leaders. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or thi figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by your fruits, you will know them. So we're going to know people by the fruit that they bear in their lives. And God will know us by the fruit that we bear in our lives and watch out man because if i don't bear good fruit he's going to cut me down throw me into the fire therefore i need to work to bear good fruit right not everyone who says to me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons and we did many wonders. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rains came and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall but was founded on a rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings. I don't think we covered everything. I think I accidentally turned with a couple pages together. I'm sorry, but when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You see, he gives us application of the law. 
application of the law. And then after his ascension, he gives us the Holy Spirit so that our hearts are no longer hard, but are soft towards God. And we have the Spirit working in us, wanting to keep the law and able to cooperate with God and work with him. You know? And furthermore, in orthodoxy, we believe even before the coming of the law, or excuse me, even before the coming of the Spirit, the image of God is still alive enough within us to recognize the call of God and respond. Maybe not as well as after we have the Spirit given to us, but certainly to recognize it and to try and reach out and try and follow and try to be obedient. Certainly, having had the Holy Spirit poured out upon the church, we're without any excuses. You know, so. so the Gospels, we need to read them. We need to hear them. We need to try to live them. Uh, this is the way, by following the teachings of Jesus. This is the core of our daily lives. And when we fail, we stand before God, and we pull our actions into the daylight, and we say, look how I failed. Look how I failed. I missed the mark, which is the definition of sin. I missed the mark. Help me, Lord. Heal my heart. Heal my mind. Heal my body. Make me better. Make me like you. And he gives us absolution. And he sends us back to the altar to receive his body and blood. And we do it again and draw closer. Every day. Every week. Right? Comments? Thoughts? We have a few minutes. Matthew. The uh, study at the uh, balance That he actually says he would liken it to someone who built his house. That's such a, yeah. such a I mean, it's such a humble thing. And the process thing. begins here. What? The process begins here and now yeah. as we begin to try and live like Christ and as we recognize our failings and we come to confession and repentance and we do it again. And then we realize where we failed and we do it again. It's not that God keeps us under his thumb. It's that he gives us more and more and more opportunities to thrive and to grow and to improve and to draw closer to him. Yeah. That's the whole point of it, you know, to live it. Try it again, keep trying, keep knocking, keep seeking, right? What else? Any other comments or questions? Sorry? The talents, yes. Yeah. We are commanded to be profitable you know, in a spiritual sense, to bear fruit, to be profitable. The Lord uses different images, but the message is the same, I think. Like the men who are given a certain amount of coin and expected to make so much back versus the guy who just buried his in the ground. Yes. Right. Or the tree that bears no fruit. Someone asked me not long ago in the gospel when Christ toward the end of his ministry came upon the fig tree that bore no fruit and he cursed it, that it should never bear fruit again. And it withered and died. What was that all about? Well, it was an image. The fig tree was an image in the gospel of the nation of Israel, which had by no means entirely turned its back on Christ. But the leaders of Israel did not recognize him. 
and did not embrace him and did not submit to him. And therefore, when he came upon the fig tree that bore no fruit, he was saying, this is a picture. This is a picture of the leaders of my people, the shepherds of my people, which in Exodus chapter 34, before the passage we read, God through the prophet Ezekiel is condemning the leaders and the shepherds of his people for not being good shepherds. And here, hmm? Well, he says that elsewhere, yeah. No, the fig tree is an image in the scriptures of Israel that where it did not recognize it, its own Messiah, its own Savior. The one who fed them in the wilderness, it didn't recognize. And so he said, okay, we're done. You know. Yes, Matthew. So touching on the application piece of what you said, the, it reminds me of that place in Acts, right, where Paul goes to the, forgive me, I'm, mis, I'm going to mispronounce it, the Areopagus. Okay, the Areopagus. Yeah, it's where all the philosophers gathered. Yes. And um, right, everyone had a everyone had a, a, a move they could make within a larger conversation, and they could have their moment in the sun, and then the, the conversation would just move on and on and on and on and on. And Paul just, like, left them after he gave them the truth. And then they were just, like, still going on with their mincing of words. Right. And I just think it's so... Like that's pretty much the world. Uh, like after, yeah. like the we like the, everyone wants to say, yeah. Or not to say, I like I used to love to study philosophy. It was all just like very impressive, but it had no this was my point. No application behind it. It didn't actually challenge. It was like a big Sudoku puzzle, but it didn't challenge. Satisfying intellectually, but bore no fruit. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. All the sap was inside. It just stayed inside. Just a closed system. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, well, I'll leave that there. I don't need to say more. Any other comments or questions before we close? Okay. We will struggle on. Are you doing okay or do you need a break? I don't mind meeting again next week, but I'm sensitive of your lives and everything. So shall we go on? Okay, we'll go ahead and meet next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, uh, before we head up, you know, if you didn't grow up watching Batman as a kid, then you don't get that reference. But uh, uh, all right. Well, I think we have a few minutes before Vespers begins, but uh, read, watch. You know, there are a nice set of short, very short videos on YouTube made by Frederica Matthews Green. If you type in Frederica Matthews hyphen green and the words Orthodox Church, you'll probably find a whole host of them. They're very short, most mo no more than just a couple of minutes long. And they cover a wide range of topics. They're by no means exhaustive, but what they are are just short introductory videos that give you a taste of what we believe, and they might be nice for you to review. So Frederica Matthews hyphen green, and if you just type in Orthodox Church or Orthodox Faith, you'll probably find a gajillion of them. So I encourage you, maybe go give them a peek Give them a listen, and uh, there might be something there that piques your interest or raises a question. And if that's the case, put it in a little notebook and bring it back, and we'll talk about it together. Okay? Okay, good. Good stuff. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Theotokos and Virgin, rejoice, O Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, for thou hast borne the Savior of our souls. God is with us through his grace and his love for mankind always now and ever and to the ages of ages. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. It's nice to see actual physical faces. Thank you, Father. Hi, Andrew. Was that just saying hi or was that a question? No, it was uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Appreciate you being around. We'll see you next time.